Hello and good afternoon friends. Welcome to CEC Live Lectures. Dear friends, today in this session we are going to talk on sociological perspectives and for this very discussion we have once again with us in our studios Professor Maitri Chaudhary. Professor Maitri Chaudhary is from Center for Study of Social System JNU. Dear friends, today uh, in this lecture you can ask questions from Professor Maitri Chaudhary and for that you need to call us uh, right in the studio. You can call through our toll free number our toll free number is 18001101430 dear friends you are requested to call in the last 10 minutes of the lecture so that you can get the deep insight into the lecture and uh, later on your queries will be resolved so let's welcome our guest professor maitri chaudhary once again and uh, let's try to have a deep insight into the topic hello ma'am welcome to Thank the lecture uh, today's topic is sociological perspectives uh, in the first two lectures, we had discussed the emergence and growth of sociology and subsequently the nature and scope of sociology. Sociological perspectives in a fundamental sense stem from both those topics which were addressed earlier, that is the manner in which it emerged and its nature and scope and perspective. I begin with a very fundamental question, what is a perspective? Why do we need sociological perspectives? If sociology is the study of the social, why can't we just go out and study society? Why can't we just see, observe, note, record and say that this is the sociological study of society? The reason is because that the, and the manner in which we understand society or the perspective or the way we look, because perspective basically means the way we look at society, the way we look at things are dependent upon who we are as members of society. What do I mean by members of society? I mean the manner in which I, as for instance, as an elderly woman would look at society would for a large extent be dependent on my age, my gender, my ethnicity, whether I'm urban or whether I'm local, whether I come from a middle class or upper middle class or which kind of family I come from, which community I come from, what is my educational qualifications. These are sociological questions. These are questions which pertain to the social nature of who I am. In other words, our natural way of looking at things, our common sense way of looking at things is not the same as sociological perspective. This is the first point that we have to recognize, a point which we had addressed in the earlier lecture that all of us have a certain understanding of society as members of society. But that understanding is usually partial. It is usually prejudiced. The ideas that I have about, for instance, class, urbanization, globalization, religion, community, rural society, agrarian crisis are ideas that I have learned in my everyday ordinary life. The sources of that knowledge would be my peer, would be my family, would be my community. They would not be knowledge which is validated validated that is supported either by empirical evidence or by logical inferences or by comparative methods. So a natural perspective, a common sense perspective, the way we naturally look at things has to be distinguished from sociological perspective. Why? Again, this question of sociological perspective and why it is different has to be relinked to the nature and scope of sociology. Many of you who would be familiar with the earlier discussions would recall that sociology emerged at a particular point of time which was greatly influenced by the scientific temper, by enlightenment, by French Revolution, by growth of modernity and the Industrial Revolution. That is the idea that the social is not divinely ordained, that society can be studied in the same fashion as the natural world can. There have been debates since then whether they are identical, but what has generally persisted that the method or the approach or the perspective with which we see society has to be understood in a systematic, logical, coherent fashion, in a fashion, most importantly, which could be repeated. 
So, for instance, if I study a particular village at this point of time, somebody and have certain kinds of findings, somebody else should be able to study that same village. Maybe 10 years later, maybe 20 years later, but would have a baseline which they could then verify, question, interrogate. In other words, the knowledge which sociology claims to have has to be validated. In order to have that knowledge, sociological perspective has to break from common sense perspective. Now, you would be familiar that there are many sociological perspectives. People would say, look, there's one perspective which emphasizes conflict. There's another perspective which emphasizes consensus. There is another perspective which emphasizes gender. There is another perspective which emphasizes the book view or the field view. Why do we have so many perspectives? Why can't we be much more economical in the manner in which we articulate our perspective and say we must have only one generalized perspective of looking at society? There have been people who actually think that sociology is not so well developed and so sociology is lacks systematization precisely because it has so many plural contending perspectives. We would like to argue very strongly against this notion that plurality of perspective means weakness of the discipline. The plurality of perspectives is natural because society is plural. As long as there are contradictions and conflicts in society, as long as there are variations between the way we look at society, the, this will similarly be reflected in the kind of sociological perspectives that we have. We at no point ought to see this plurality as a weakness. What we ought to see that this plurality is its strength. And this plurality is not just a free-floating availability of diverse views, but that we need to engage, contest and debate between these perspectives. And a contest, debate and interrogation of each other's perspectives would lead to a certain kind of dialogic understanding which would pave way for a certain insights into society. What also must be clarified, unlike perhaps natural sciences, that it's not as though one sociological perspective is inherently wrong and another sociological perspective is inherently right. It is just multiple ways of trying to engage with that which is constitutes the social. It is not easy because society is not just an empirical object which you can analyze, experiment, tabulate, count the manner in which you can physical world. The social world is a world inhabited by human beings with ideas, understandings, as we mentioned before, their own perspective of looking at things. Human beings are not only meaningful beings, but they're concept bearing beings, concept bearing that they have their own ideas about what society is about. Everybody in society would say that, look, our society doesn't allow this. Our society is not doing as well as their society or our society is great or our society is not so great. They not only have ideas about what constitutes their society, they have value positions about what constitutes their society. This distinctive nature of the social which is meaningful and not comparable to a physical empirical object makes the necessity of so many kinds of social perspectives to emerge. Let's sort of briefly look at what these kinds of perspectives could be. One kind of sociological perspective which emerged tried to model itself exactly like the natural sciences. Uh, we can refer to August Comte as an example very often seen as the founding fa father of sociology who initially thought of calling sociology social physics. That is the domain assumption that society can be understood very similarly the, in the manner that physical world is. Just that social laws can be discovered very similarly to the manner in which physical laws can be discovered. 
However, even at that point of time, Comte was careful to state that, look, sociology would be one of the last sciences to develop. It would be one of the last sciences and most difficult sciences to develop because its object of inquiry, society, is so complex. Subsequently, we had scholars and uh, soci sociological classical thinkers like Emily Durkheim who argued that look, there is something called the social and the social can be studied by specific delineated methods. Durkheim actually wrote a book called Rules of Sociological Method. A lot of it is derived from, in a certain sense, a naturalistic method that you will be able to discover patterns in society. You will be able to discover causal laws or causal methods by why one particular event leads to another particular event or one phenomena leads to another phenomena. To give you an example, you would be aware that Emily Durkheim also did a study on suicides. He did a comparative study of the rate of suicides in, among the Catholic community and among the Protestant community. What emerged was that the rate of suicide was significantly lower among the Catholic community. The question that Durkheim posed was that commonsensically we feel that individuals commit suicide for psychological reasons. So the onus or responsibility or cause for suicide should be lying at the psychological level, at the individual level. How, what would sociologists study about it? But his findings, his comparison of suicide showed that seemed a pattern. Why was there a variation between the rate of suicides among the Catholics and the rate of suicides among the Protestants? The argument that he put forward was that the Catholic society was more well integrated. People were more connected to each other. And in societies which are more integrated, the rate of suicide is lower because the individual is able to communicate or integrate with that larger other members of the society better. Whereas in a Protestant society, individuals were more developed in the individuality. They were searching for truth in a certain sense by themselves. That decline of social solidarity on integrity led to the possibility of individuals actually to the propensity of suicide. So what Durkheim did through a sociological perspective was to show that something can be demonstrated, demonstrated through a comparative study and demonstrated much as in the natural ways. However, he was very aware that the social is not the same as the natural. The social is something much more distinctive. The social is linguistically constructed, culturally constructed, meaningfully constructed. We can't just jump in and get data from the social. We have to have a method. We have to have a perspective to understand what constitutes the social. So we won't go into details that maybe for another talk. He introduced the concept of social fact and taught us through that perspective how do we engage with the social. So this was one kind of perspective which was emphasizing the nature of the social as external, as objective, as coercive, as general, as something that the individual has no choice to uh, you know, make. When we are born, we don't choose which family, which caste, which religion, which nationality, which community, which part of the globe. We take it for granted. Our language, our family, our religion, our parents, our siblings and brothers, our everything appears to us as an objective reality. It is out there, it is external, if we go against it, it is coercive. As against this kind of perspective, which emphasized the outside, the objective part of it, we had others who emphasized the subjective part of it. Uh, very central in this are the symbolic interactionists. You would be all familiar with the works of the social psychologist George Mead, George Mead, who had this incredibly wonderful book called Mind, Self and Society. Many of you would find it interesting to know he didn't write that book. He actually, that book was put together by his students after his death uh, as posthumous class notes. But he was trying to argue the point that, look, yes, 
we, this society, is external to us. This society is objective. At the same time, it is meaningful and subjective. I am a product of this society. I also produce this society. That is, there is a dialectical relationship between the subject and the object. This is an insight which was drawn from another classical thinker, Karl Marx, whose whole understanding was that you have to emphasize the manner which the social is produced by human beings, by human labor, but human beings in turn are constructed by society. This is simultaneous, this is mutual. Therefore, his very famous sta statement that human beings make history, but not as they wish. They make it according to the conditions of the context within which they are located. For instance, today we wouldn't be able to have this telecast lecture if we did not have the technological wherewithal it is. I can only do what I can within the conditions which are given to me. But what I can do as subjective that put in my own bit of subjectivity in what I talk. All of us are similarly positioned in society, objects, products, as well as producers. We need to look at it in this dynamic fashion. To go back very quickly, what I'm trying to argue, there are multiple sociological perspectives. If we want to make one broad division about what the sociological perspectives are, we can say that one emphasizes the objective external nature of society, much like physical sciences. The other emphasizes the meaningful intersubjective part of society that we as producers are able to produce and engage. While the first is, uh, tries to emphasize causal relationships, establishing would migration lead to greater disintegration or integration in a city? Would diversity be good for an industry or not? Causal explanation. The other side of questions that would be asked is, why do people believe in this when we know this is not true? How do we explain faith? How do we explain emotion attachments, uh, which sometimes may go even against rationality or self-interest of the individual? In other words, the questions that the ones who emphasize the intersubjective emphasize the meaningful aspect and meaningful as also affectual. What do I mean by it? We mean that not only do we do things, we think about it. In other words, we cognite about it. In other words, we have you know, certain cognitive ideas about it. Apart from cognitive ideas, we are also attached to those ideas in an affective way. We feel strongly about it and we have certain emotional attachments to it. And sociology as a discipline tries to understand the manner in which this is constructed. There is this wonderful book by Peter Berger and Luckman, which talks about social construction of knowledge and talks about how we social con construct society by ourselves. How do we make sense of it? How do we act? How do we typify? How do we express ourselves through signs and symbols? How do they become fixed? How do they are transmitted across generations and are reproduced and are reproduced as well as reconfigured or recast? This dynamic relationship between the individual and society is in fact central to sociological quest. It is central to any sociological perspective that what is the relation between society on one hand, external or objective, the individual with ideas of selfhood and meaning and affection and emotion. How do these two relate? And regarding that, there are also perspectives which emphasize one aspect and others who emphasize the other aspect. Leaving a while apart the objectivist and the subjectivist perspectives, we look at the manner in the scale which the sociologists look into. Some sociologists look at macro questions, macro issues, industrial revolution, capitalism, urbanization, structures. The others very often look at micro setting. How do we behave in an interpersonal setting? How does the teacher talk to students? How do people in an office interact with each other? So very often we have sociological perspectives, one of which emphasizes the macro perspective, 
one which emphasizes the micro perspective. These are not compartmentalized. Very important for you to realize is that these are not compartmentalized. These are just methods and manners by which we can understand society. Supposing I introduce a perspective which you may not find in a particular textbook, don't get worried because textbooks are also created by us as individuals and knowledge is not fixed as knowledge changes, the contours of the discipline change. So you may have very different kinds of perspectives mentioned in very different kinds of books. What is important for you is to validate it. What is important for you is to look at who were those theorists in the original who articulated uh, that kind of perspective. Closer home in India, we've had a debate uh, about perspectives very roughly called the book view or the field view. Early in the 1950s in Indian sociology, there was a debate uh, which argued that perhaps we will be able to understand Indian society better through the ancient books that we have. And this perspective was often called Indological and practitioners of Indology were often great scholars of Sanskrit and the classical languages. And the argument being put forward was that perhaps if we look at this text, we will know how society is organized, what is the social order of this society. Subsequently, however, there was a great deal of criticism about this approach, arguing that the field view or the actual society does not necessarily correspond to the text view. And sociologists ought to go to the field to figure out how actually people live. A very good example often cited in sociology is the example of caste. Caste, as you know, is a term which is of Portuguese descent, which again brings in the question of translation and words and their origin and whether they're able to really capture the nuances of society. But the point I wanted to uh, argue or bring forth is the distinction between the book view and the field view. So the book view would suggest there are varnas and there are four varnas. The Field view, when you actually go to a village or a city or wherever, what you will see is a multiplicity of jatis, a multiplicity of communities, subcasts, subcasts within subcasts, uh, tribes, ethnic groups. Very often the same term jati is used both to refer to an ethnic group as well as subcasts, sometimes even to linguistic groups in a complex uh, multicultural uh, uh, urban entity. So what happens over here is that a textbook becomes limited. It has its own strengths. If we want to find out uh, what was the theological or the intellectual perspective, but it is perhaps not quite suffice to understand how society actually operates. I finally sort of come to the point uh, where we began from, the point that why do we have so many perspectives? Why can't we just have one perspective? And the argument I put forward was the complexity of society itself demands that. And I'll give you some very, very quick examples to what I mean by the complexity and also what I mean by the dynamism of society. For example, for very long, you had a certain understanding of society which people felt was looking at it from a male perspective, that the society was being looked at from the eyes of the men. And many of the events or incidents or situations of women were neglected because it was all being seen from the male perspective. An example I often give and I tend to repeat it is the example of work. That work was a category, a concept, and in the early years of the Indian census, very often people found there were very few women mentioned in, as women workers. And after 19, mid-1970s, when you had the emergence of the women's movement, you had a report called Status of Women, the question was asked that we all know that women work. Women work as agriculturalists, they work as domestic workers, they work as uh, potters, they work in textiles, they work as stone breakers, they work in so many, so many sectors. 
why were they not counted? So the question then arose that they were not counted because the people did not recognize that the nature of work looked very different if you looked at it from the bottom up, from what we were done, and people tended to see work as glossed over as only that which was organized and counted. Therefore, you had the emergence of a feminist perspective. More recently, we have other perspectives like a Dalit perspective. We had perspectives globally called post-colonial perspectives. All these perspectives have enriched sociology, not weakened it. Therefore, to conclude, we must reiterate the multiplicity of perspective is the strength of sociology. It is, the, it is necessarily linked to the nature of society which is complex, multifaceted and inhabited by concept-laden human beings. Thank you. The second uh, part of uh, today's discussion is on concepts, sociological concepts. And the point I would like to uh, communicate first is that there is an intrinsic relationship between sociological perspective and sociological concepts. One of the things that you must realize is that when we do sociology, different parts are connected. Even when we do theory, different parts are connected. This has to be so because society is a combination of interlinked parts. We can't study them as discrete, separate parts. So the first point I want to put forward is that you have to realize that there's a relationship between perspectives and concepts. Perspective is the way we look at society, the theoretical framework. That is the perspective with which we are trying to make sense of what goes on into society. Each sociological perspective usually generates its own analytical tools or what we call concepts. Concepts are important. If you recall in the preceding talk when we were discussing sociological concepts, at the tail end I introduced the concept work. And I introduced the concept work to problematize what concepts are about. Because the example I was giving at that point of time was that in the census, and you know in census it's just numbers, nothing can be more objective than that, just one or two or a million. And yet people started feeling that women's work was not being adequately represented in the category women's work. The questions therefore they raised were, 
Was it an error, an error of the enumerator? Did he forget to put in or add or ask the right questions? And finally, scholars, sociologists, feminist analysts figured out that the problem was not so much of counting. The problem was the category or the concept of work. In society, the concept of work, as has been used generally, had got associated with a certain kind of work. The work which is done in organized sector, work which has fixed emoluments, work which is maybe 9 to 5 or 9 to 6 or whatever, work which has a legitimate institutionalized recognition even probably in government documents or other kind of documents. What about the work which is invisible? How do you render it visible? It means in other words categories and concepts are analytical tools which help you to render certain things visible and render certain things invisible. So unless, until you had a gender critique of the category of the work, we did not have a concerted attempt to re or you know expand what constitutes work. It was only in the 1990s that was an effect and a great effort was made to make people realize that a lot of work which we do is unrecognized, untabulated, whether it is when we are cooking at home, whether a woman is washing her cattle or her buffalo, or whether a woman is collecting water uh, and fuel wood, walking miles in the morning, that kind of work is not calculated. A lot of work in the unorganized sector is not calculated. So what happened was the concept itself was re-articulated or recast. I give you this example to make you understand that concepts are not fixed entities. They are not givens. They are not like this is a glass and the name of this is a glass. This object is a glass. Concepts are not like that. Concepts are analytical tools and we mistake them as fixed entities. Given forever, all times of history, we are going to make a grave mistake, an analytical mistake. Concepts are analytical tools. They help you to see certain things and they sometimes make you not see certain things. It is the plural perspectives and the ongoing debate within the plural perspectives, the dialogic nature of the discipline which poor forces changes concepts. In the case of work, it was actually a social movement, government policy, civil society which all together said, look, you have to redefine work. This brings us to the second part of that concepts. Number one, are not fixed. Number two, concepts change historically. Number three, that concepts are socially constructed like any other concept. They are not God-given. They are not divinely ordained. It is therefore very wrong to learn up a concept by memory. A concept helps you to understand. It doesn't have fixed bounded entities. It is a tool of analysis. The fourth point that I wanted to argue and which I started off with, there is, a, there is an intrinsic relationship between perspective and concept. A particular kind of perspective very often generates certain kinds of concept. Another perspective generates certain other kinds of concepts. Some concepts are generally accepted and used in the discipline. For example, in sociology, all of you would be familiar with the concepts of status, concept of role, concept of role conflict, concept of class, concept of maybe reference group. These are many other concepts which are there in society, maybe assimilation, maybe diffusion, maybe power, maybe state. We are familiar that these concepts exist. But what I want to communicate to you is how are these concepts linked to perspectives. And I begin with a perspective which was very, very dominant, not only in sociology and social anthropology globally, but within sociology in India. And the example I have is functionalism. All of you are very familiar with what a functionalist perspective is. A functionalist perspective was a perspective or a theory which was trying to compare the nature of society to a biological organism. The argument which informed this perspective was that just, there are, just as there are parts in a biological organism which work in equilibrium, each part does its bit, and together they function in order to sustain the whole, then the society is made up of different parts, discrete parts. 
and each part has a particular role and together they're able to let that particular society or human organism function. This is a certain kind of perspective. Within that perspective, for example, they articulated the concept of status and they articulated the concept of role. The assumption was that there are positions in society and those positions are what are called status in society. The incumbent who occupies a particular status that I may be occupying the status of a teacher, I am the incumbent, I am not the status. The status is independent of me and as a teacher I have a certain kind of role to play. As a woman, I again occupy a particular kind of status and I have certain roles to play. These roles are given. These roles are given and they are important for the society to function as an, as an equilibrium for it not to dysfunction, not to break apart, not to reproduce. Functionalism as a perspective therefore has often been accused of being a perspective which defends the existing status quo. In other words, it defends the world as it is. It defends the society as it is. It errs in a certain sense that it is built upon an assumption which in a fundamental sense can be called commonsensical. I can give you a small example from Talkit Parson, one a sociologist of great repute who also had influence on Indian sociology. And in his explanation in Gender Division of Labor, he brought in this question of role where he said that for an effective, efficient, nuclear family in an industrialized society, the man must be the breadwinner. And that would be the instrumental role which the breadwinner man has to perform. In contrast, the woman who runs, looks after the house and domesticity would be playing the expressive role. That is looking after emotions, caregiving, taking care of children, elderly, cleaning, washing, a whole host of activities which we associate with domesticity and reproduction of the new generation. What's the problem? In a certain sense, there is no problem. The only problem is that it sounds too much like the description of an existing nuclear family rather than an analytical category which allows us to understand the variety of societies which exist in this world. As all of us are familiar, many of us in India who belong to urban middle class families may not have had mothers who went out to work. But many of us who belong to poor, rural or even working class families in cities may have had mothers and grandmothers who went to work. This introduces a more complex concept, the concept of maybe class, maybe the concept of caste, maybe the concept of whether you're located in a region which is rural or urban, which complicates the notion of status and role. In other words, we have to then distinguish whether status and roles are forever fixed, unchanging, or, or do we have any normative or value-laden ideas about which kind of status is good and which kind of role is good. So functionalism as a theory, which was based on a certain understanding of what would be an ideal, modern, developed society, roughly corresponding to what people thought was a North American modern or West European modern post-World War II society, would be the typically good society. The problem is that the scientific temper of sociology, in, uh, of, uh, sociology is that we do not take the normatives as given. What is good in one society may not be good in another society. The questions which we ask are what leads women to work in a particular society and what leads women not to work in a particular society. The questions are different. So when we look at the concept of status, when we look at the concept of role, when we look at the concept of work, you notice how different perspectives will ask very different kind of questions. For example, if you take a Marxist perspective of the gender division of labor, they will ask different questions about the concept of work. For example, in the World War II's, in the world wars in Europe, a lot of men went out to fight in the wars and uh, the economy, the domestic economy, the industry, the various manufacturing sectors, the service sectors had to be looked after by women who had to come out and take the place of men. When the war ended and men returned, the women were asked to go back to their homes. 
Now this prompted the idea of which Marx calls the reserve army of labor. The women's labor was seen as a reserve army of labor which was brought in as labor when the economy were, you know, needed it and thrown out when the economy did not need it. The cultural, so it's important to historicize concepts. For example, uh, we had the partition in 1947. In many communities which were affected by the division of the country, women had, from families which had never worked before, were perforce forced to go out into the public sphere and work. That changed. So here you have a situation where the taboos or the ideas about work radically changed because of a catastrophic event which impinged upon their private lives. You have various other, if you recall my discussion on perspectives, uh, we said there was a macro perspective and we said there was a micro perspective, there was a perspective which was emphasizing structures and the external social facts and the other perspectives which were engaging with the micro. Now, when we come to the micro perspective, we, when we come to symbolic interactionists, when we come to social constructionists like Berger and Luckman, we see that their perspective generates another set of concepts. Sometimes the concepts are common. It could be still be role. It could be still could be status. But what they do here is to show the manner in which people learn those roles and status. And also, these scholars try to problematize and show how the status and role and the identity of the incumbent are interrelated and differ in different kinds of societies, in different kinds of communities, in different kinds of classes. So uh, the idea of work to go back, which we started with, may be a taboo among certain kind of communities. Even in the uh, United States of America, upon which Talcott Parson based his study, when he said that men must do instrumental and women expressive role, large number of black women worked. Large number of black women ran their houses. They were heads of household. Closer home, we have had a phenomenal number of studies which have showed that a lot of rural households are actually female headed. So when we take a concept, we must play around with the concept. We mustn't just say, how do we define this concept? What we must say is, how can this concept help us to analyze and show us different parts of society? Just like a camera, they may take a particular photograph and you say that, look, this is absolutely truth because they've taken a photograph of somebody. But people could ask, but why did you not take the photograph of somebody else? What is the frame or context within which you shot that frame? So perspectives in that sense are frameworks and concepts, therefore, are derived from that particular framework. Let's go to some other kind of key concepts and show how those concepts again are derived from perspectives and how concepts change. Let's take the concept of culture. Now in social anthropology, when social anthropologists first studied uh, other cultures or that is Western scholars came to Indian or Latin American or African countries to study what they thought were cultures of natives or other cultures, they made a certain uh, understanding central. Their understanding was that culture was territorially bound. That is, people inhabiting a particular geographical territory had a particular culture. In other words, geography and culture were coterminous. So very often they said, we study the culture of the Noors or we study the culture of the Andaman Islanders, or we study the culture of the Todas. And now here the example is that these are bounded communities. And many of these communities were simple communities, simple societies, homogeneous communities. So culture was seen as coterminous. Coterminous with territory are bounded. Now that notion of culture has come to a great amount of critique in contemporary times. The concept of culture, which was once associated with the bounded territory, has now come to be associated with other concepts, concepts of multiculturalism. In an urban society, in a developed modern society, you have many cultures living side by side. In India, we are fortunate that we've always had many cultures. In Europe, unlike, uh, unlike us, they very often had nationalities predominantly constructed of one language or one culture, which was not the case over here. 
So questions of multiculturalism, cultural contestation, plurality of cultures started being raised in sociology. So we noticed that the concept of culture started acquiring new dimensions. Likewise, there were others in sociology or in social sciences or even in broadly in humanities who argued that culture, when you say somebody is cultured or so and so is very cultured, the assumption is that you're talking about high culture. That is, you may be knowing classical music, maybe you know classical dance, you are learned, you read and therefore you're cultured. That was an association of high culture. That too came under critique by both sociologists and social anthropologists for whom Everything which is socially constructed is culture. So it is not only my music, not only my dance, not only my food, but even my tools or even the way I eat or the spoon I use or the pestle I use to make my masala is culture. Culture is that which is not natural. Culture is constructed. I give you the example of culture again to show you the possibilities of concepts changing and how these concepts changing are related to disciplinary shifts and focuses and also to shifts in real life, in society. Again, a related point with culture, at one point of time people felt that if they come to one place and study that people, they will be studying one culture. Increasingly people find there's a great deal of migration. Cultures are spread. We have diasporic Indians in different parts of the world. Are their culture the same as ours? Is culture fixed or is culture a constantly evolving pattern? Can sociology look at culture as a fixed given or does it have to one, historicize it and also link it with other, other concepts like social structure, social institutions like state, maybe processes which are very recent like globalization. So we have a multiplicity of concepts, but the emphasis in sociology has to be to historicize concepts and to see the limits and possibilities of concepts. Not to, not to for even a minute to see concepts as fixed, frozen in time. A better analogy would be to look at it as a process which is unfolding. These are the tools which we have in hand and we use it to explore. Maybe in the middle of our field work we find that this concept is not helping us. Maybe we take another concept to help us. So we have to understand it as our instruments in order to understand the social or the real. Concepts apart from status and apart from role, apart from culture, we have other concepts, for example, institutions. What are institutions in society? Is it a concept? Yes, it is a concept. Social institutions in sociology, again, is very often differently defined, but roughly whether it is functionalist or whether it is maybe the micro sociologist or the symbolic interactionist would argue that human beings, as they continue to act, and make a habit of acting in a particular manner, the habituated form of behavior leads to certain kind of institutionalization. But the question then arises, is it an automatic response? Just do repeated habitualization lead to institutionalization? Or are there the role of differential parts of society with differential power? For example, can we say, is the state a more powerful institution than maybe the university I teach in? Or maybe a college that I taught in? And the question is, yes, certain institutions have greater power, which leads us to another concept, the question of power. And again, in sociology, it's very important not to be just to be able to define power or to define power as separate from authority or see power as defined by Weber or by Foucault, but to see power as something which is inherent in any social formation. It's the nature of power which historically changes. The concept of power may remain the same, but we have to look and see whether the, our understandings of power as embedded in a particular concept holds good in transformed world situations. For example, at the height of globalization, a lot of people started saying that the states were losing their sovereign power that the states are not as powerful as they were before because you have global institutions like maybe the World Bank, 
maybe the International Monetary Fund, maybe other international institutions with which the states have gone into treaties or agreements which have greater role to play in society. Our is the state as powerful as the family? No, obviously not. The state is far more powerful. But the family has a different kind of power. And that power, uh, going back to a talk we did a little while back, is not only coercive, but is affectual and cognitive. People feel emotionally attached to the concept of family. Is so is family a concept? These are terminologies which we use in order to understand the social. You could ask me a question, which a lot of people ask sociologists, that why do we need these concepts? These are ordinary words. After all, we use the word uh, family, we use the word class or status or culture, even in our everyday life. What is it which is different in the manner in which we use it in sociology? And that is the tricky question. It is tricky for a couple of reasons. It's tricky because the common sense concept and the sociological concept are closely interlinked. When we talk about religion in our lives and religion in sociology, roughly we are referring to the same entity. But what is different in sociology that we are self-conscious about the concept and its meaning and its limits. We are not claiming that this concept is the best, like we could call, claim that, look, the way we cook food or eat food is the best. Sociology is inherently interrogative, so it interrogates concept too. The other reason why it is so difficult is to go back to a point I referred to in an earlier uh, session is that human beings are concept bearings. What do I mean? We mean that human beings also are informed by sociological knowledge. Everybody who is hearing this discussion get to know something about sociology. Media carries something about social science. That becomes part of our common sense. This is what Anthony Giddens called double hermeneutic. That is society, the sociological knowledge now feeds into our everyday lives. We have ideas. The role of media, in fact, has made it much more poignant and much more important. But the last point that I would like to emphasize before I close is the fact that concepts are critical and what we have to do when we do with concept is to be critically self-aware and be ready to validate it, a point which we do not need to do when we use common sense ideas. Thank you. Well, thank, you. Okay, thank you so very much for yeah. uh, giving us a very productive session on sociology and I believe that this is one of the basic lectures uh, which would definitely help students in uh, understanding what sociology in detail. Ma'am, we talk about culture in between, that yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. how what we do, what we eat, what we carry becomes absolutely, the culture. Absolutely. So, uh, can we say that uh, in the present context we are uh, uh, communicating culture or we are communicating sociology? Uh, well, uh, you know, it, uh, that's a very difficult and interesting question, uh, but um, in certain sense, sociology has become part of our culture. You know, so you, you will be having panel discussion on television, which is talking about maybe the things which I'm talking about, you know. So in a certain sense, modern culture is highly reflexive, as Giddens says, and could be considered so. So it's a dynamic entity, it changes and evolves. It changes and uh, it is, uh, and the uh, change is also for the good because uh, it keeps on bringing the uh, positivity. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. So, dear friends, we believe that you might have liked today's lecture. And uh, uh, if you have any queries or if you want to give your feedback for this particular lecture, then do write to us at info.cec at nic.in. This is our email ID on which you can contact. If you have any questions which you like to be answered by Professor Maitri Chaudhary, when uh, next time she visits our studio so do write to us we'll try to give answers to your question when she visits us next and this lecture is going to be uploaded on youtube very soon so that you can access the lecture the number of times you want it so dear friends it is our humble request to you keep watching us keep writing us your feedbacks are yes of course very very important for us once again we would like to thank uh, professor maitri chaudhary for uh, her precious inputs to thank the lecture so and uh, thank Thank you, ma'am, for uh, giving the deep insight into the lecture. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you Thank once you again. Thank you very much.